What up, though? CC with Hip Hop Weekly Radio, and I am with a pioneer today of the drill music scene and the man behind Lawless Inc. record label in Chicago. If you are from Chicago, you definitely know who this man is. You definitely know about the label. But for those who don't know, he has given us rappers like King Louis and has made hip hop recognize that Chicago artists got talent and he is also a positive influence for the city and is definitely needed these days. So I am with the man, the legend, Lero. That's ain't right? You said it right. I, 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 I don't know why I want to keep saying La. Lero. Lero. My name is Larry. So Lero a nickname. It's okay. You know. So how are you doing today? I'm doing good. I feel real good the way you brought that introduction in. It's like you mentioned some things and touched on some things. And I like that. I like hearing that. Like that felt good. Yes. That well, you know, good. we always have to give people their flowers while they're still here. And I'm a burn this age. On that note, let me burn this age. <laughs> sage is burning. Oh, you got, oh, wow. You got the little uh, flamethrower, little mini flamethrower kind of thing. Oh, Lord. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I ain't going so I just broke the glass with the sage. Burn the sage. <laughs> there we go. Let's get into it. Let's get into it. Yes, let's get into it. And let's just go right off the back and talk about Lawless Inc. Because you're definitely not new to this. You've been in the music game with the record label. I feel like it's been about 10 years. Am I correct? I had Lawless Incorporated 10 years. I started, I had a production company and label before then and um, mm -hmm. stuff before then, but Lawless Incorporated 10 years in. Yes. As a publisher, a marketer, promoter, management, consultant, um, distribution, all of the above. 10 years strong. 10 years strong. And, and I remember... a rule of thumb with business, any business that survived over five years is successful. Really? Okay, five that's, years. That's a rule. In five years. That's, that's the that's the breaking point of a business of a corporation. When you start a business, it's five years. It's making it past that five year mark. Mm. Yeah. Well, you yeah. doing good. You doubled that. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. That's one of the internal accomplishments that you know in your head. It's like, okay, if I keep it going, it's just maintaining the business for five years. It's like it's gonna work. And I had that in my head. You got mm -hmm. to, you got to. And I remember you had signed King Louie. Um, I'm yeah. not sure if he's still with you guys, but I just remember when King Louie was signed to you. And again, you ain't new to this, you true to this. So how are things looking today as far as the artists and everybody associated with the record label? Um, it's looking good. Like, as I said it before, um, um, the company is a publishing company as well. So I have a lot of publishing. The, um, the whole drill scene, the beginning of the drill scene, the start of the drill scene is actually documented with the work of Lawless Incorporated. So that's another reason why I don't even go and try to protest that or beat my chest about what I've done. Um, it's documented through history. It's documented through YouTube, through social media and things of that nature um, that took place that was documenting these things, you know? It's just a person asking the right questions. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And you know, we still got a lot of young youngins that think, you know, right now is the drill scene. But if you think about like Lil Durk and G Herbo, like some some years back, they didn't have the national acclaim like they got now. They, now yeah, they, they are wasn't. everywhere. They so have, just talk a little years. bit about you as the pioneer of drill music, just talk a little bit, just a quick history. Okay, list. you got you know, sometimes I'm we gotta teach a, these kids a little bit of a history list. Let me touch on this part. So <laughs> I'm 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 in Chicago, I'm doing music, I'm I'm renting out DJ equipment to clubs, to nightclubs. I have a strong passion for music. Uh I was a mortgage broker, um, so I fell off that to do other things. So now I'm in the nightclubs. And I'm in this riding through the streets of Chicago. So I'm seeing the stuff going on in the streets of Chicago. And I'm hearing the music directly because I'm in nightclubs renting out DJ equipment and I'm DJing. So I'm hearing the music directly and I'm seeing the streets react to it and I'm feeling it. You know, so I had saved up some money to start a, a record company with a publishing company, imagine because this was a goal. So I'm like, this is the time. I'm like, this is it. So I just started looking. 
for artists and start listening and just, and I, I heard the sound. Um, and the sound I heard was stuff that I was familiar with and what I understood was the streets of Chicago um, and the crowd from the streets of Chicago because art imitate life. So I started seeing the life being imitated in the artistry. And I knew that this was time. I knew that the world was ready to really hear what Chicago had to say. You know, at the time we had the most murder, uh, we had the highest murder rate, you know, that it got the nickname Chirac that came from Louis, by the way, uh, one of ours. Uh, so it was like, this is the time. So by the time I got to hear, when I heard Louis music, I knew it was it. He was like talking to the streets. He was like a street reporter. Mm. You know, you can hear everything, everything. And he, he embodied everything. And then he had the cadence and he had the flow and he had the, um, the quick. So I'm like, it's time to go. And I just went hard. And of course the music being so hard, and me being so passionate about the music, music being so hard and from the streets, it wasn't easily accepted. Um, I'm used to that because I'm from racing courts. I'm from the, uh, you know, Wild 100 Chicago South Side. So I'm used to not being easily accepted. I've never been easily accepted. So I always had to go on and beyond to show a person that I mean well. Mm -hmm. You know, so it was that wasn't a big challenge of mine. Um, but in doing so, I started seeing that I was pushing a whole new subgenre of hip hop because I started seeing uh, um, reporters trying to coin it drill. And I was asking them not to, but they was doing it anyway. And I'm like, you know what? I told her, I said, this is cool. If we keep going, we're going to create a whole subgenre of hip hop called drill. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I'm, and that's when I just got super excited. And I just really, really started pushing. And I kept all the gang banging out the music as far as dropping signs or dissing any gangs, but I made sure I pushed the music because. If I push the music through Chicago, through the radio, through the clubs, of course, in Chicago, they know what they're saying if they gangbang. So I had to push it, push it clean. Clean, not meaning profanity-wise, clean meaning no, um, uh, just no high gang activity in the, in the lyrics, you know? And that's something I don't think that the industry was ready for. And that's something I pioneer as well, I, I noticed is regulating that. I don't think a lot of execs know how to regulate it because they don't understand it. Mm -hmm. So if you don't understand it, how can you regulate? It? Right. So before you know it, you're putting people in power in a position that needs to be regulated and needs to go through. Um, they need to go through some training, you know, to understand you know, what it is to get money and have influence at the same time. Gang influence. It's a difference. Right. You know, you know, so kept it clean, pushed it and I seen it working and I was excited, passionate. I spent every day. Listen. I spent every dime I had. I started finding money. I started going. I, I think I had, I spent, I spent so much I had. I remember my mother telling me I was working Katie single pop out. And I had like, I was working it and I was in working it. Like it's spending the money, like in working the song independently. And I heard it playing on the radio. I seen the numbers growing. And um, I went and grabbed some money. And my mother was like, You said you weren't gonna touch that. I said, Mom, but I gotta, I gotta finish this. I gotta finish this. I'm telling you. It was it was a, my last hundred thousand. I had a hundred thousand I put up, and um, I grabbed my last hundred thousand and I opened it up. And she was like, "You said you weren't gonna touch it." I said, "I know what I'm doing. I know what I'm doing. Just trust me. Trust me." I spent that hundred. I spent that money. <laughs> I spent that money. <laughs> she said, "I hope you know what you're doing." Right, just like a I mean, mom. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, it was everywhere. It's like. Being an executive, being behind the scenes and curating the music at the same time, like being that close to the music where you're picking it, you're going through it. You're, you're, I'm talking to the producers. I, I got background in engineering, so I'm, I'm playing with the sounds. I'm, I'm putting effects on them, put gates on them, I'm putting flanges on them, I'm dropping it, I'm double tapping them. I'm like, I'm doing like it was fun. Mm -hmm. Like it was fun then working with artists that was hungry, so they listened. I'm, I could talk to them like, do this, let's change this, let's change. And it was fun, let's do this song, let's do this with this. And it was just like, every idea was working. Okay. It's like you can't, it's like you couldn't miss. It was like, our, I felt like I guess Steph Curry. <laughs> I'm, like, I'm, like, I'm going, I'm half court. <laughs> you know, nobody believed in Katie. They thought Katie wasn't gonna make it. That was like, a, got that, was, that was like, I shot the ball from the, the end zone some damn well. I was out of bounds, like on the opposite side of the court, threw the ball, like, okay, watch this. Mm. 
<laughs> that's how that one felt yeah. like like that yeah. was a high like you couldn't i can't explain this is a high just like you on cloud nine, 10, 11, 15, 20, 35, 40, 50, 100 pounds. <laughs> and you're on the parachute, you just like, like shit. <laughs> like all this is out here, it's up here. I'm like, oh shit, look at this shit. <laughs> like you're seeing everything, like birds out of you, like, wow. Mm. Like, oh shit, like you for real? And the air is not air, it's like helium. <laughs> No. So you like it? Like, so you like it? <laughs> okay. I remember mm -hmm. Katie, Sasha go hard. Uh, yeah. I know Drizzy and Tink still making music, but I remember going to a uh, concert at Reggie's. And I think those four ladies either they all were opening or they just do like did like a collab where everybody got on stage and they were like mm -hmm. spitting their stuff. So yeah, shout out to those ladies. Like I, I've been root. I st I've been rooting for Tink. I really want to see Tink. Yeah. I love Tink. I love Tink music. I Tink, love Tink. Tink. I think Tink is a little bit underrated, but not mainly underrated because she do have a situation. Yeah. But I believe in her. I think that she's really talented. I think she's a lot more talented than what people expect. What they that think. That part. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I love Tink. Yeah. Tink, Tink got some. Tink got some. I consider Tink like Tink got some landmines. Like, okay, walk. Look, walk over there if you want to. Trying to say, go walk over there if you want to try. You're gonna step on one of them landmines because she got some shit. Boom! Yeah. Boom! Gonna lose a leg. She got some shit. Like right. Tink, Tink got some shit. She did. I ain't gonna lie. I'll fuck with her. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, let's talk about some of the rappers on the label as we speak. So I Ooh. looked at it on the um IG page. I see Killer, Icy Duck, Solo the Dweeb, Valley Media. You also got some DJs like DJ Wayne Williams. DJ Nafitz, uh, Slick the Third, Mo, Don Franco, among others. So what is it about these artists and DJs that attracted you to them and wanting to work with them? Um, this all organic. Uh, what I've done is it's just organic. I just, I wasn't looking. I just think that was right there and presenting itself. So I just identified and connected the dots with. Um, I often, like lately I've been moving, I talk to, I talked to a don't judge me. So we're gonna talk about mental health. I talked to a I talked to counselors. I talked to a I talked to a psychologist. Ain't nothing wrong. With my best friend's Hold a psychiatrist. Now, let me tell you, let me tell you, give me the best information. Mm -hmm. My pastor. Ain't nothing wrong with that. That's what's up. That's what that's what give me the best clarification on anything. Mm -hmm. Um therapists can't help me. I overqualify. Psychologists are still practicing medicine. They're doctors and they're still practicing. So they're still figuring shit out. You know, uh, talk to a pastor, someone that's been studying the Bible, that's been studying history, that's been studying um, personalities of different great individuals, because these are stories that's in the book of the Bible. You know, so you got these stories and they identify to different individuals and the different light that they may be getting at that time or the different energy that they may be getting at the time. I think it's so many things that's unexplainable um, that take place with us um, and our being. It's amazing. So, you know, I found myself feeling these ways. And it's about helping people. I've been helping people a long time. And you've been helping people for so long and it, you don't get recognized for it. And no one wants to, you know, give you a shout out for it. The people in competition with you, they, you're helping them and they're trying to get better than you. And you're not worshiping money. So I don't worship money, it's paganism. So I look up and a lot of, you know, it's like, what is this? What is this about? I just like money for comfort and convenience. That's it. You know, I don't want to clout, I don't clout chase. I don't give a fuck about that. I just like comfort and convenience, you right. know? And, you know, it's fucked up that we live in a world where our comfort and convenience is associated with a fucking price tag. Yep. <laughs> I, I, didn't, I didn't make this shit up. I just got to live through the shit, you know? Got to right. make it through the shit, you know? So that's kind of what I went to us. It's, it's like understanding that it's natural. So going to the artists, we got, we got, we're going to, let me see, we'll start off Icy Duck. Icy Duck has been an uh, artist with Lawson Incorporated for a while. He was featured in the field, um, World Star Hip Hop field. Um, Icy Duck, I signed him. He was incarcerated at the time. I heard him rap over the phone, beating his chest, going crazy. And he just had so much power, passion, and conviction behind his lyrics. And it's all true. So I heard it was raw talent. I told him when he get out, call my phone, he got a deal. He did that. I signed him. 
Um, we went through a little hiatus with the company where I fell back. I didn't have a passion for music at all. Um, I started getting it back. When I got my passion back, Icy like, I've been waiting on this. Let's go. So I'm like, okay, let's go. So we got Icy Duck, then we got Solo the Dweeb. Solo the Dweeb started giving me my passion back for music with his energy. Like he's a very energetic performer. He has some dope lyrics. He can do about anything when it comes to lyricism. Uh, pretty much any kind of flow. Um, and But he has his own and I like to hear him do his own, um, which is his own meaning some artists, you'll hear them and then you hear what they want to do. Mm. You know, I like hearing him when he's in, a, in his mold. You know, it, 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 his, his artistry is therapeutic. Okay. So you have to listen to his music and you can hear songs and you'll know he was going through something at that time. You know, those may have been um, therapeutic. So his energy crazy on stage. So I, I seen him perform and I was just like, I, I had to work well. So we, we, do it, we did a deal together. And we got Slick the Third. Slick the Third came about as he's a producer, um, very talented producer, engineer, um, songwriter, um, artist himself, videographer, graphic designer. Um, he came around through my nephew. My nephew is Franco and okay. Mo Kilos. Okay. Um, so they were rapping and doing their thing and they would like ask me to help them out and things of that nature. I fall back and let them know if they're serious. I see them one song. So if y'all are serious, y'all about 50 songs a piece. Then y'all can talk to me. That's how Slick came about. They started coming through the studio space I got and working, getting songs. So they earn a slot and they're talented and they got a story to tell. Then we go to Killer. Killer's from the hundreds. So I know our family real well. Um, didn't know she rapped. Um, she was inspired from, um, I guess, the music in Chicago and seeing how things take place, how things been taking place. And she just, she got a story to tell and music is therapeutic to her as well. Mm -hmm. So I heard it. I'm like, oh my God, she's young, 24 years old. I know her father, I know her mother, I know her whole family. I know her whole family. So I'm like, whoa, shit. Oh, <laughs> shit. And she about to talk about this shit? Like, whoa. Okay. Like, wait till y'all see this. Like, wait till <laughs> America get a load of this one. You know? Hi. It's like, oh, shit. It's like, so this stuff has got me excited. Then you got Wayne Williams come to me and um, we did a, a deal together where um, he has a label. He started an management company. Started, um, so I came aboard that, and I'm um, the VP of that. So I help out with that, and I'm like, you know, hey, if I help out with this, can you help out with what I got going on? And he's like, cool. You know, he's more on the R&B side, so I'm waiting to get some R&B stuff to really attack. Um, I got an R and T deal that I I can start with his his label, and I'm getting that worked out. And this guy got some strong stuff, real powerful on the vocal side that I think I can work with, but you'll see a lot come out about. And then we got DJ Nathan um, and DJ Wayne Williams on there as well. I'll let you know, you can hear first, I started a, with DJ Nathan, uh, we founded a record union, DJ record union um, called DJs Incorporated. Um, so with DJs Incorporated, we're gonna provide a 401k for DJs, medical for DJs, dental for DJs. Also has it to where we can have different brands that want to use marketing to get directly with the DJs. And we can go ahead and filter that money through the company where they can get the stuff, the money directly to them and use their social media platforms to market and promote um, the products and get the vibe going. Because most DJs are the ones getting the vibe going anyway. I do this shit. I know what we do. <laughs> I, know what we, the vibe. I know what we need. <laughs> I know what we do. <laughs> you know, and then we got valid media. Valid Media is Valid Media. They've been doing media in Chicago for a very long time. Um, he's behind a lot of things. His name's Greg. He's behind Valid Media. He's been behind a lot of things. So I partnered up with him as well. He helped out with me facilitating things. And he also runs Valid Media. So why not have a media arm? Like, mm -hmm. why not? And of course, you got my main man on there, Daryl Jones. He's been my attorney for over 10 years. Entertainment <laughs> attorney. He's Kanye West attorney. Oh, um, okay. he's the attorney to a what lot of people. Busy. Put it like this if you ask him the story about drill and ask him the behind the scenes paperwork on how it started, he'll tell you everything I've done because all my stuff is documented through paperwork as well. Um, with who I consulted with, who I helped out, red line contracts, things of nature. I've done so many things behind the scenes and I'm connected to so many artists 
that people just don't know about. Um, right. The last artist that I did something with that that passed, King Von, I'm connected to him in another way that people don't know about. I redlined his contract, I went through his contract and redlined his contract before he signed it. In fact, they waited until I went through the contract before he signed it. And I'm the one that told him, don't put publishing in there. Um, I took the publishing out so he can get a publishing deal later. So I heard his manager talking about he didn't sign publishing. That's why. <laughs> it's a lot of things that took place. Um, that's another story, another conversation. Um, yeah. A lot of things, there's other stories and a lot of conversations. Like they, what Ralph say is deep in the rap. Yeah. Yeah. Where, where the drop? Deeper. You gotta hit the drop. Deep, 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 deep. No, 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 I mean, you got a lot, you've done a lot for a lot of people. And I know a lot of the conversations when it comes to like people who own their own labels or just managers that the grind and the sacrifice, the patience, and you're oh, yeah. literally devoting your life and time to grow these artists and get them to a good place where they can make their dreams, like they can live off their dreams. They can live off their music. Yeah. But unfortunately, sometimes, I don't know if this has happened to you, but sometimes yeah. some artists, they get offered a big deal by a big uh, record label and they say, well, thanks, but <laughs> dude, I gotta go over here now. Like, how do you, well, how does that if you run a, if, if, if you run a real record label, mm -hmm. that doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. What happens is you partner with a major. They can't, a major can't come and say, and the artist say deuces. See, that's the misconception of me is I don't, I don't manage artists. I manage artists that sign to my record label. Okay. So I, I manage my label. Okay. <laughs> so that's how that can't happen. That's why that hasn't happened to me. It hasn't happened to me. The only way that has happened to me is artists I've talked to in the negotiation with, you know, and the majors come and just give them a, a bigger deal or get them a situation. And a lot of times it'd be the influence that um, plays a major part being in Chicago, that influences it here like that. So, you know, uh, someone come in, a major come in from LA or New York and they get to the throwing label names around, and artists around and producers around and these guys that, you know, people see on TV that they can call up and access, you know, that that, that takes negotiation a whole nother turn with music. <laughs> right. So that that's what has happened to me. Those things, not not that, not that part. Those are management stories that they had an art probably on or something. Okay. Yeah. And it just seems like also on the flip side that 10 years ago, everybody needed a record deal. Everybody was begging and thirsty to get a major record deal, right? And now it yeah. just seems like now everybody rather be independent. Mm -hmm. And I would love to hear your take on why that is and how Lawless Inc. has played a part for those artists in Chicago. Artists in Chicago witness the independent record label do things independently. I partner with majors to do projects. Um, and they see a label still exists now today, 10 years in, independently. Um, and they see it working. And that's the difference um, between these other cities and states. A lot of times you think that we hear this music, you think these corporations exist in these towns. They don't. So the artists, don't get a chance to see it directly. So this was a chance for them to see, touch, feel a record company operating, you know, bumping to me outside the clubs, asking questions. I People DM me and question me all the time and I talk to them. Mm -hmm. If it's Chicago, I talk to them all the time. And you know, I see artists doing something, I let them know, hey, try this, try that. You know, that's just um, what it's about to me. It's about that culture part. It's about the education part. Cause one thing you, 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 you was mentioning, but you did mention is, you grow with these artists. Mm. I also grew with a lot of these artists. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times you grow with the artists and they realize that, you know, they, they was making bad decisions and you hear them in their testimony later on, they say, you know, I had a lot of growing to do. People don't often think about who they, who they growing, who they grew from. They said they had a lot of growing to do. Who were they with when they wasn't there before they did the growing? Right. <laughs> And what was that relationship like? You know, them, them some stories probably, right? Right. I, uh -huh. look, <laughs> I know look, you got uh -huh. stories for days. You've been around a whole bunch of people. You probably seen a whole bunch of things. 
<laughs> I know you got stories for yeah. that. I got, I got a lot of stories. I got a lot, a lot, a lot of those. I'm about to say, yeah. you want to share one? <laughs> <laughs> now, that'll be something we can do at a later date. We can have like the audience ask questions and have some fun with it. Yeah. I've been around 10, I've been around 10 years. So you gotta think if I started a company in the, see, I started a company independently. I didn't just start my, I started a company independent, which means I fully staffed a corporation mm. with all positions filled, paying salaries, 10 years straight doing it. You know, so oh, where's the people talking about that, that, that got paid from the company? You know, yeah. yeah. 10 years strong. So, you know, that that's that part, you know, that part you got to think about too. It's like a lot of people don't work with me. I don't work with a lot of people. I don't hire a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I took care of a lot of people. I listened to a lot of stories and had um, a sentiment that inclined me to do things that business wouldn't have allowed me to do. Mm -hmm. You know, those stories don't come out often. You know, so it's, I got a lot of stories. You know, a lot of them. You know, you know sometimes in this business, you know, when you, you got a good heart, you're not treated well. Yeah, it's it's definitely mm -hmm. a, a entertainment business is not the business for the kind heart. Mm -mm. Yeah, I was gonna say that, and also it's not for the weak hearted either. Like you have mm -hmm. to, you have sometimes you gotta you know, know your worth and know your place and fight for it and demand mm -hmm. it. Because if you allow people to just keep taking and taking and taking and taking, you ain't gonna have nothing left. Yeah, so you're right. That's how that go. That's mm -hmm. how that go. That's definitely how it goes. And um, I definitely want to um, get back to the drill music scene because... Shout out, shout out to Misty's Artesian Spring Water. Well, the proceeds of this water goes to fight against breast cancer awareness. Um, we also have is that oh, outside wow, of Chicago? Called... Like, can I, like, I'm, I'm in Michigan right now. I ain't never seen that pretty bottle. I got them coming to Michigan. I'm, I'm, I'm the EDP of the company. I just did a deal. Uh, I got distribution coming to our grocery stores and hospitals and things of that nature. Because you think about it, when, when someone is affected by cancer, what do you find out first? The hospital. The hospital. The hospital have cafeterias, right? Mm -hmm. Bending machines, right? And we all need water. And we also know that the different stuff that's in water and different chemicals that exist, which we don't know about, add to the increase of the risk of cancer. Mm -hmm. So this is natural spring water, like we always have drunk forever and have human beings been fine and disease-free from a lot of different things, from drinking what? Natural spring water. Like, it's no-brainer to me. That's what's up. That's what's up. It's, 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 it's organic. <laughs> Ain't nothing wrong with organic. No, so, organic. Um, back, not back to the rest of the program. The question was <laughs> drill. Okay, shameless plug. That's all right. Uh, this is about you, not me anyway. So, but yeah, we've seen a lot of success from drill music. I think a lot of artists will say and call themselves successful drill rappers, musicians, yeah. what, what have you. But there is also a, a flip side to that as well. There has been instances there have been violence there has been unfortunately death and it seems like when i talk to people in chicago you got some people that don't blame drill music they feel like you know before there was drill music there was violence so you can't just blame it all on drill but then you have other people that do want to blame it on drill like as the pioneer of this music scene i'm curious to know how you feel about it well i can i can start off with stating, stating something that's a pure fact, um, the Chicago murder rate was equivalent to the murder rate in the war in Iraq, and that's why the nickname came Chirac. Yep. That was over 10 years ago. Yep. So we go from that till now. Is that murder rate still that high? I don't know. I think it's significantly lower. I hope so, but yeah. I, 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 listen, I, I, I know so. We just speaking facts. I know so. Mm -hmm. I don't think Chicago is the highest, uh, has the highest murder rate. Is the murder what is it, what is it called the murder capital of the United States? That's how they label it. That's yeah. how they. That's how they claim. Yeah. I don't think Chicago is that place anymore. Um, and they say drill music did what? Let's talk about how many kids drill music helped. 
yeah. how many jobs drill music created. Let's talk about that with people that was directly on ground zero with the things that was going on in the street. So how this industry being well coming from Chicago and how it hit Chicago and the revenue from it has helped. I think it's documented through factual data showing the crime rate. That's how I feel about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you I, know, mean, I, I love I love it. I think it's great. I think it's done a lot. I think it's something of uh, uh, the culture needed. Do I yes, I think that with things such as this, it, it, it has to be understood. And that's that's more conversations with individuals like myself and certain individuals that was on ground zero that understand the music and the culture just as they did everywhere else. They gave it that they let uh, media um, have outlets to talk to individuals and gave them a platform to explain the culture right. of it. I think that needs to take place. Um, and then people will understand because Yes, it's, it's, it's highly infectious with gang activity and gang culture and violence and things of that nature, but that's what it's birthed from. That's the streets of Chicago. And sadly, but true, you know, people like to not look at this as a fact, but gang culture is, gangs is an organization, correct? In any organization that's order, that's a chain of command, that's things like that, there's a thing called structure. Structure. So whether people like it or not, there was structure, strong structure, some structure and discipline, um, area acts implemented in this culture that people do not implement right now to get results from individuals. So it's individuals that understand what they need to do to get results. It's individuals that understand what it is to move in that light and have followed those teachings to get results and become man. And mm -hmm. that's something I think is not understood, not talked about often. Um, because as you know, when you're getting disciplined by a parent, or in, let's say, not say parent, let's go say hmm, corporate by your boss, yeah, mm -hmm. or someone in a higher position of the of the letter of the chain of command, what often happens? A person tries to get away from that any way they can, mm -hmm. and it, that's why most of the times, even in the military, they take individuals away from their home and put them in boot camp away from everybody where they're in a structured environment where they can't escape. And if they do, they're AWOL or they just get kicked out, mm -hmm. you know, because it's strong disciplinary acts put in place to keep individuals in line. Um, what's the same in gang culture? So, yes, they will run to the civilians and say, hey, this isn't right. But we're going to talk about it, but we don't want to participate in it when it's time to get disciplined. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's just that part needs to be understood. And then they understand what America, and I think the world will understand at some times what they enable when they buy into certain things from these artists that are influenced by gang culture. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it seems like you kind of touched base on it a few times in that statement that, you know, like how how hard is it to keep an artist focused? Because you are working with people who are from that environment and not even judging, but you are a product of your environment. And sometimes if you don't know no better, you just don't know no better, but you see the talent, you see the potential in this person who is happens to be an artist. Like how hard is it to get artists focus on not the rah-rah-ish but the music itself um coming from chicago you have to have an understanding of that the rah-rahness mm. and understand what it what it takes to come from the rah-rahness and understand this simple thing that they teach us in school um that every adolescent learns uh, we always talk to our children about too peer pressure peer pressure is a lot more powerful than what we think Peer pressure adds to a lot more bullshit than we actually like to acknowledge. Um, so I, I'm a parent as well. And so as being a parent, and, uh, you know, I have raised my brothers and my sisters in Chicago. So I understand that and understand that you that's when you have to shit. You gotta be nosy. You gotta get in somebody's fucking life. You gotta get in their business. Yeah. You know, and, and and you might have to go undercover to do it sometime and act like, you know, I'm kicking it and I'm with the bullshit. I'm all the way with it. And then let them know later, like, uh-uh, I don't know what to do. Kind of funny out there. You see how you know, move them around. And then move them around. Hey, we ain't going to do Because you, you got to do it. Mm -hmm. It's just a part of it. 
that comes along with it if you want to get to a level where you're making money from it with music. Because that street stuff will affect you from the bottom line very fast. You look up and there's people around that's not supposed to be around. It's beefs going on that's not supposed to go on. Spikes in clubs. Um, you're trying to spend money to uh, move an artist around, uh, pay for security, switch cars so people know the cars they're in, um, things of that nature. So it's a lot that come along with that too. You that know, people thinking. don't see. That got me thinking about Lil Dirk and his girlfriend. Like literally yesterday, everybody was talking about how they literally had a shootout at their home in Atlanta, not Chicago, Atlanta. And a lot of people were saying like, Lil Dark, like we love you. And, but we, you need to look at your circle because it's too many instances that yeah. is putting you in harm's way where you, you, you're in Atlanta. You try to get away from all that and it's still following you. Like, bro, like something's not right with who's in your circle. So when you said that part, that made me go right there yeah. because thank yeah. God that we're not talking about R.I.P. Dirk in India, you know. For, for real, but here's something right. that we're not thinking. Here's something. Here's something that we're not thinking about. People keep showing it, saying what happened. Um, thinking about how their life changed. Now, now their comfort has changed. You know that 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 their children' life has changed. Um, their mental has changed. Mm. Uh, it's trauma that has now been put on uh, a young woman and a young man um, mm -hmm. that's trying to escape things like this and, you know, but now it's more trauma. There's more trauma that with the children, you know, displacement. Because when things like that happen, you have to move immediately. Now, the, the, those kids is gonna remember that for the rest of their life on why they had to move somewhere where they were comfortable with and they didn't really have a real explanation for it. Or if they did, oh, they get an explanation because some, something violent happened. Yeah. So now they live their life and they're gonna be doing simple things to them, but it's not simple to other people. Like, you know, did you, did you tell somebody where I live at? How, who with you? Uh, don't, don't tell nobody where I stay. Uh, uh, if you got somebody with you, don't come by. Uh, um, uh, That's uh, right, don't, don't, look, don't, don't, don't be on live and have my address. Uh, don't show the lights plate number, don't show the address. Uh, and then people looking at you like, what is wrong with you? And you're like, no, nah, I just want to make sure I'm safe. And they looking like, no, nah, you're, daddy do? <laughs> you're like, you're like, no, nah, didn't nobody do nothing. I just, I just know, I just, you know, I, I, I just understand these things keep me safe. Mm. You know, and other, and other people looking at it like, you tripping. Like I'm at the crib, my crib all over here. I'm telling people, pull up on me, pull up. Oh. Now you can't do that now. Mm -mm. So that's now, to people that can't do that and explain it to people that do do it, it's a disconnect. You know, and then, they, and, and then we got this thing from Chicago, it's called PTSD. So now I'm, I'm, I'm feeling the pain in them kids because I'm seeing some children go through, about that, go through having PTSD that actually moved out of Chicago. Like, wow. Like you just said, like they, you, they right. They actually got the fuck out. Yeah. You know, so let's, let's, let's pray. Let's pray for the kids. Let's pray for, you know, let's pray for them kids getting through this and, and, and being okay. Right, you know, right. For real. They didn't um, ask for it. Right. Kids didn't ask for it. They did not mm -hmm. ask for it. Um, mm -hmm. But again, thank God that everybody is okay. And absolutely. We can live. They all can live to see another day and be blessed and highly favored. But um, I just wanted, before we move away from, kind of the music and your record label uh one more time lawless inc is there anything you guys got coming up um anything for this year that you will want people to know lawless inc is 10 years in so mm -hmm. of course with 10 years in we have a 10 year anniversary so um there's a lot of special things i got planned throughout the year that i'm gonna pop up and just go just go through just explain things about the history of the company how it started the different people that were influential in helping the company, maintaining the company, keeping the flow, building it, the different peaks we went through, the different lows, you know, all of it. I just want to be able to have a platform and let people know this is an independent record company that's in hip hop that's been here 10 years, that pioneered a subgenre of music, of hip hop, um, that has influenced so many other genres as well. 
um, this is 10 year, the 10 year anniversary of Lawrence Incorporated. So that's special to me. Um, and I think the public don't understand how special it is to them um, with the sound that has came from this record label um, to the world. So that's, exactly. with that alone, that's special enough to me. And of course we got that whole roster are gonna drop projects all through this year. And I'm excited about the music that we've been creating because yeah. it's fun. I'm having fun with it. It's like fun, like seriously. Like I, I, I'm having a ball with this music. So That's I good. can't wait to let the world get this back. That's good. And I can't wait to hear some of it. And, you know, Hip Hop Weekly also has an internet radio station. So, you know, can't wait to play some of that as well. You know, just let's let do that. Know. Let's get me on the station. Let me get <laughs> on the station and do my thing. Yes, yes, you know? yes. Um, so I know in the past you have worked with and aligned yourself with uh, John Monopoly. And I was just kind of curious because I saw him on Drink Champs uh, not mm. too long ago. So I was wondering if you two still work alongside each other. Uh, we're friends. Um, mm -hmm. And like every friendship, you go through the things with the friendship. So uh, we work with each other five he called me if you need we don't work with each other's capacity of have official titles mm -hmm. starting john monopoly early on with laws incorporated um as you know but as you know like i stated i started a record company that was fully staffed mm -hmm. so i fully staffed a lot of positions and paid a lot of salaries and those are stories as well right so that's what's up and i've seen that he's in the cannabis uh business and i hear that chicago ever since they passed those laws everybody named mama is trying to get in that damn cannabis <laughs> uh, you see, so I was you see me smoking about you if you, you see uh, me smoking. lunch you know I'm, I'm 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 waiting i'm here i'm here in chatter but i ain't seen no checks <laughs> so I'm, I'm 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 gonna keep smoking and not talk about what i'm smoking until then <laughs> how about that i'm gonna keep blazing okay. big ones and not talk about what I'm smoking in the meantime, between time, while people waiting, you're going to look up. Remember, independence, mm. I'm going to have my own shit. Lost Incorporated shit, Zah. <laughs> okay. I'm just saying, like, I just feel like everybody, like, overnight is like, oh, I'm about to, uh, I'm waiting to get approved for my license. It's like, damn, is everybody it's a, it's a like, way. in the shop? <laughs> it's, you, you know how it goes, it's the way. It is the Every, damn wave. It's the wave. Everything coming the wave. It's the wave. Yeah. Gotta get on the wave. We'll get your surfboard. Get your surfboard. Surf Love. Get your surfboard. <laughs> I mean, I'm not mad. My only thing is because I know uh John was saying about how he has like the largest black owned cannabis uh business. But I know like here in, in Michigan, especially Detroit, like once they kind of gave everybody the green light, it was a lot of like racism. Like they were only approving licenses for like white people and Arabic yeah, people. They, they, they wasn't doing it for the black folks. They're, they're, they're doing that now within the industry. It's like redlining. I'm also a part of a group called uh Marijuana Hall of Fame that started by Vince, um a guy a, a partner of mine that's here in Chicago. So I've been really in, involved in hearing the talks today. Also the company that John is a part of is called Viola. Viola, uh, Viola is Al Harrington and a guy named Abe Gibbons. That's I'm close friends with Abe Gibbons. So I was talking with him before Viola started and the things that the hurdles that they had to go through because I have deep business conversations with individuals. So I was hearing about that before it actually started. And they are, the, they are one of the, uh, the number one black owned uh, cannabis companies. And we need more. You know, we need more and we don't need it to be regulated and redlined. And real estate is called redlining, but with any industry, when it breaks, it, it's not regulated 100%. First, it's regulated for them to make the money, and then it goes into being regulated with things like, you know, acts for fairness and discrimination and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. These provisions hasn't came with this industry yet. They will come, and they will come for these issues that you're seeing right now. Yeah. And you, you, those issues, right? The, they're going to exist and they're going to get fixed. The kinks are going to get fixed and worked out. Um, you got to think prohibition, liquor, all that stuff took place. And I would like to go through history and see the kinks that was worked out with that shit. Because I'm pretty sure when they first started giving out liquor licenses, blacks didn't get them right away. I mean, the guy who made what, uh, what whiskey was it? Jack Daniels was the sl a slave helped concoct the whole. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
And I now we don't, we we don't know that like that. But it's like, but how many hundreds of years did him and his lineage today have to wait before they got their credit and now uh -huh. they start making money off what that one man did? I, I dang, I cannot remember his name, and I'm mad now. But yes, it's like. Mm -hmm. I, I can see that happening all over again with the cannabis. That's like, yeah, it's like we ain't looking at, if you look into history, is history repeats itself. These things are not new that's going on. They're not, a lot of things aren't new. It's just being done again and again and again and again and again. Yeah. And, again. and you can go back and see something that took place and see um, the similar results of it and the things that took place to get it in order. And some of those methods do work. Like even what I'm talking about with the marijuana, the cannabis industry, we, I'm pretty sure that's going to happen because I'm pretty sure when they started passing out liquor license, they probably wasn't giving it to blacks right away. I'm willing to bet. <laughs> no, you're I'm, definitely right. You know, so just like any other licenses that they started giving out, they didn't pass them out um, right away to the people that they were discriminating, America was discriminating against. Mm -hmm. Go figure. We're going to give this to the people that we have discriminated, no, they're gonna first try to get it straight with them first. And if we don't notice that we're being discriminated against, then there won't nothing be said. Now we speak on it, it's like, oh, yeah, I don't, how the fuck did that happen? Fix it. Yeah, we fix that shit. I fix that shit. So enough of us have got to say, we, we have noticed that um, not too many people like getting these licenses and the dispersers are not in our neighborhoods. And we love this shit too. So what are we gonna do? Are we do we have to not buy stuff in the neighborhoods from the people that we don't want to sell? Or are you guys just gonna work this shit out? That's all. Just pose the question. <laughs> right. When it comes to the dollars, they they'll wake up, they'll be like, oh really? Oh, oh they're like, I'm yeah, yeah, yeah. They 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 put somebody, they finna put somebody in coveralls with a toolbox. What are they gonna do? George, George fucked the George fucked the applicant. George, yeah, yeah, he didn't fucking look at that part. Yeah, George, and George is gonna get compensated very handsomely to say I fucked up. Mm -hmm. Sorry, mistake. What a doozer. <laughs> <laughs> fucked up. Right. And then they make it clean, and then it's all good, you know. But when we do it, they try to charge us with shit. But when they do it, you know, it's American. Mm hmm you already know how it is but wow. you know just going on your ig i saw um i did see a picture of you with the chicago police which i was just like oh let me stop on this one you know i tapped on it mm -hmm. and i see that you gave them a big shout out and in the caption you pretty much were saying about how you understood how hard it is to be a cop just to maintain a positive healthy mental attitude in a hospital yes. environment and i just want to know a little bit about that backstory of that picture because i found it so interesting and oh okay um yeah okay um on that that picture was taken because of the incident that took place with uh my nephew um christopher um um and his mom so he had an incident where he had a breakdown and the police showed up um, she called the police and she explained to the police that her son was having a break. Mm -hmm. um, he had got his hands on a firearm. I don't know how, but he got his hands on a firearm. Um, she, she walked outside the door in the condominium. He comes outside the firearm in his hand and the police is right there with their guns drawn. And she says, you want to kill me? And he says, yes, I want to kill you. And know what the police said? My man, you're not in trouble. Just be cool. Mm. And he ended up going to a mental health facility for a little while. She's okay. The officer, okay. Nobody's hurt. How about that? Thank God. So what about the fact that this was another young black man who had a gun in his hand with police with guns in their hand, but he's not dead. And so I went up there and I tried to get him $10,000, but they can't take much. I said, you know, this is what I would have paid for the funeral. You know, which... The funeral would have been about that roundabout. Probably would have saved some money, giving them ten grand. But they they couldn't they can't accept stuff like that. So I just thought of the next best thing. I sat down and I talked with the mother, and we like you know we gonna cook for them. It's barbecue. So barbecue went up there to the station and just let them know that we appreciate this, even if the officer himself didn't get it. 
we we let them know that we appreciate it. And then it, you know, it was a backlash with the officer behind it, you know, that I heard about. Because people trying to say he was supposed to shoot him because he had a gun in his hand. That's the flip side of it. They looking at him like you should have shot. It was a black male with a gun in his hand and you had the ups on him. Why didn't you shoot? Because he understand mental health. That's why. Because they have programs implemented that they volunteer from at that district to learn about mental health. And a lot of those officers have took those courses. And the, the public don't know about things like this. You know, they quickly jump down and thought about stuff that they're doing wrong. What about the stuff that they're doing right? We, we big on saying, give us, give, us, give them flowers now too. So if I'm, so I understand what I've done and I've done for the culture and I, I do for people on a regular basis that, that don't get recognized. Of course, I see it with other people. So yes, I cannot not notice the, 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 the everyday heroism that these guys display that gets us recognized. Mm-hmm. You know, and I got my stories with bad, I got my bad stories with police and I got good stories. You know, I'm a little older than what people think. I used to get my ass beat by police officers in Chicago and they beat your ass and drop you off at another gang area and make you walk back and hope you get fucked up or killed. That's what they do. That's what they used to do. You know, I've been through a lot. So I understand when I see a good cop. Yeah. You know, that's all that's about is just me understanding that. And I also mentioned some on my social media because I seen D.L. Hughley on his platform use the image of that that came out on, on the news and they posted it up without stating anything about it, making it look as if the officer wasn't doing his job because he didn't shoot my nephew. D.L.? Yeah, D.L. So, I mean, I addressed it just real quick on my social media platform because like you went there and you seen, nobody asked why we were there. When everybody want to talk about that officer didn't shoot him because they say he walked away and left her by herself in the hall. No, he didn't. And he, the, the, the whole thing was under control just because, you know, you see a picture, a picture is a, speaks a thousand words. So you can take an image and make it narrated to say whatever you want. We all know this. There's people that do it all the time that, that represent other individuals and we call them lawyers. So, you know, we know how this shit goes. Okay. <laughs> That's real. <laughs> Okay. Like, like That's crazy. Shit. Yeah. I like, mean, let me... oh, I'm sorry. What were you just going to say? Nothing. Just going to lawyers and, 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 you know, just the media personnel that will manipulate an image. Yeah. You know, that's very good and trained to do so. So mm-hmm. I'm just trying to just let people just the other side of it, just a different narrative. Whoever want to know can know. I'm not going out my way to publicize it. No. If anybody asks me questions, I have a hell of a lot to say about it. You know, uh, probably not too many people going to talk to me about it, too, because they know I got a hell of a lot to say about it. You know, that's how shit normally happens. So I'm going to just show that also as being real and authentic and organic because that's how shit happens. Right. <laughs> no, I mean, you know. it's, it just struck me because I lived in Chicago from 2012 to 2016. And even oh. after the fact, it's just like. The Chicago police have a bad reputation. I mean, yes, they have one of the worst cases across the country as far as as far as solving cases. You know, they have had nationally public police brutality, you know, yeah. televised. So, yeah, there's not a lot of good you see when it comes about the police. But when you do see one thing, it, it makes you pause and be like, OK, well, we do got to give them credit when it is due exactly. now yes when they be messing up oh we're gonna be loud about it and sometimes we might have to block traffic and shut the city down but when they do do something good and they're trying to make an effort like shout out to all those police who are taking those courses because we have always been saying they are not trained to deal with mental health you know when somebody is having a moment or an episode whatever or breakdown whatever you want to call it yeah. nine times out of ten them police officers don't know how to handle that Mm-hmm. And nine times out of ten, they probably would have just pulled their guns and shot him down. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. like, I'm just so happy to hear that your nephew came across a cop that knew how to handle it. You a know department. I mean? Look, here's the thing: a department with officers, because it was more that it was, it was one uh, one officer in particular. But you got to think, the officers are moved as a unit; mm-hmm. they're moving as a team. So they all understood. They all followed each other play. You know, so that was all orchestrated and facilitated with that department in a way that they run things. And I understand that, you know, and of course, 
directly with that officer that didn't make the decision. Yes, yes, you know, but you gotta believe that it's officers up there letting them know that you didn't make the wrong decision and you, you did a good job and you went with our other training that we got where we understand these mental health issues, you know? So it goes into that. And yeah. like I said, we, like you just said, that, that was my same sentiment. If you would have killed them, we would have been up there loud, boisterous, ignorant, clown, and tearing up stuff. I said, I'm going to do the same thing and show y'all love. I respect That's how I went up there. Yeah, I, said, I, I played music. I DJ played music right in the front of the station and, and passed out food. Yep. I respect that. I really do. Beef burgers and Beyond Meat burgers. <laughs> everybody eats. Like, everybody eats today. Be everybody. Everybody eats beef. Everybody eats beef. <laughs> <laughs> Who ain't eat beef? <laughs> well, I'm pretty much towards the end of the interview as far as questions, but I do have one more. I want to come back, bring it full circle to Lawless Inc. Because obviously you are a pioneer and a lot of artists probably see you, hear about you, see other artists on your record label and probably think to themselves like, I would love to work with him. And what mm -hmm. do I have to do to get myself together so I could bring something to the table so he would want to work with me? So can you give any artists out there advice as far as what you're looking for and what you're looking for an artist to bring to the table as far as Lawless Inc.? Um, I look for artists to bring to the table a positive mental attitude. I look for them to be in a position where they're ready to be coachable with their craft and be in a position where they're ready to deal with the individual and be vulnerable with their craft and allow someone to you know, take that thing that's so precious to them and help them curate it and get it to where the world can see and understand how special it is. Uh, that's mainly it. And anybody that possess that can reach out to me however which way they want. You know, Instagram, you see me in traffic, flag me down, oh, I'm in, cool. I ain't tripping. I need to know. I want to know so I can let the people know. You know, of course, I'm going to look at the numbers and all that because if it's what it said, if, if you say it's what it is, then the people are going to speak. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so it's, it's very simple. It's not hard. We're not going to make this difficult. It's just all fun. It's talent. It's getting this gift out to the world. So everybody can hear it, you know. I would love to have a song right now that me and you can debut and say, we heard this shit first. Oh my God, listen to this. Like, uh, that would be dope, wouldn't it? Yeah. Like, so yeah, like, come on, bring it in. I want to hear it. Let me hear the music, come on. And I know Chicago finally has opened up since COVID. So. Oh yeah. I feel Chicago like on fire right now. Time. this is the perfect time. If you have decided to switch your career or focus more about your music while everybody was quarantined and locked up and everything else, I feel like this is the perfect, perfect time. time for artists to go out here and show us what you've been working on this whole time. Yeah. Yes, perfect Don't time. Get, I, I know it's a lot of people that's been sitting in, in the house quarantine and playing them instruments. Um, working on a mixes, uh, making making beats, like getting some new styles or new flow. They've been working on trying to let the world see where that shit at. We want to see it. We want to hear it. <laughs> get it to me so I can get it out to the people. That's all I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get it to the people. You know, that's it. I, you know, get great music out there so we can enjoy this shit. This life. We only live till we die. What's your short? <laughs> What's your short? We only live in the die. So let's come on with it. Let's hit that shit now. I need some stuff to take me along this route. I need some theme music. <laughs> shit. Don't, don't you need some theme music? Hell yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I need that I'm about to cut somebody out music. I need that I'm in love music. I need that I'm just silly as hell. I'm about to have some fun music too. And I need that I'm high as hell and I don't know what I'm coming down with music. <laughs> Look, I ain't mad at it. Like you said in the beginning of this whole interview, you a DJ too. It's about the vibes. Vibe. It's Sometimes I vibe listen to more. music and it's like, I got to be in a different vibe. Like when I want to hear some J. Cole, like, you know, I got to be in a different vibe. But if yeah. I want to hear some Future, some Young Thug, that's a different vibe too. Like, a different vibe too. That's a different vibe too. You know, they, they, we live through them. You know, sometimes we want a trap. But we don't want to trap. We don't want the time for trapping. 
but we want the good time from trapping. So we just want to hear that trapping good time shit. You know what I'm saying? You know, that might motivate us to pull up to the light and ask somebody do they want to buy some drugs and we catch ourselves like, hold on a second, I'm not Jeezy. Okay. <laughs> yo, he one of my favorites to this day, though. Jeezy, yo. Young Jeezy. Jeezy, Jeezy gonna have you going to serve. That was, I'm from Detroit. Jeezy, so listen. That's our guy. <laughs> Jeezy had me serving. The, Jeezy had me up in the third district talking about some, uh, you know, I got it soft or hard. <laughs> Just want to let y'all know. Oh. <laughs> Look, I was too young to be listening to uh, hmm. Trap or Die. I was just walking hmm. around like Trap or Die. It looks like what? Yeah. But like I hey, said, it's a vibe. So it's a vibe. It's a vibe. You know, it's a vibe. You know, that we got, we got, we got. Why we got young thug man talking about gunner leaving the backwood on a nightstand man? Make you want to smoke backwood smoke? Like that's me. He's talking about me. Yeah, you know, that's me backwoods on the backside. I motivate the smoke backwards now. Shit. And I ain't got a check from backwards yet. Did, did, edit that. Backwards haven't cut the check. Yeah. Yeah, y'all gotta run him checks, y'all. Y'all gotta run him check. checks. Yeah. Run some well, checks. I'll talk about the flavors I like. <laughs> what is uh -huh. everybody like? Everybody like the uh white Russian. White Russian, black Russian, the yeah. cream. He got that coffee, he got that smooth. I like that smooth stuff too. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, them the ones I go to, white Russian and black Russian. Um, wild rum. Mm -hmm. I like the wild rum one they got. The wild rum one, it's I cool. That one. Okay. Yeah, that wild rum is cool. I like that one. It's <laughs> real smooth, real smooth. It's a vibe. It's a vibe. <laughs> yes, it's a vibe. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta, I gotta have them blunt, so I don't like papers too much. I don't know. It's, it's like I, I gotta find the right paper. To give me a smoke. I like get, the vape I, I, though, to be honest with you. I like vaping. the vaping. I try vaping. I don't like vaping that much because it seems unnatural. Mm. I'm like, I'm like big on I'm big on the 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 funk sway that comes along with things like smoking. Like I like you want to see the herb because I know like the oils. I like the oils. I like the I like the nostalgic I like the nostalgia to stuff. Like I like that 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 richness and the culture that's along with stuff. It's like, mm. this is how they smoked it. They lit this with fire and, and, and held the fire. You know what I'm saying? Like fire, not a mm -hmm. coil, <laughs> not an electronic coil. That's something different. That's something that Thomas Edison, you know, <laughs> I don't want you that. Need to get I want Bob like Marley. Business and get I want you Bob like, Marley. I can see like, you having like a cannabis, not even just a dispensary, but like a cannabis like bar or something. You know, like I would love to be having like like a hookah place, but just flip it to like cannabis, and you can have everybody yeah. have their like you can have different like cushions and all that yeah. stuff. Oh, yeah, geez. Yeah, different eyes coming out, different smoke. I like to get the see what comes along with the cannabis industry is this too. If you have a place like that, we got our different level of smokers. We got the people that smoke the Za, we got the people that smoke the OG, and we got our people that smoke the Reggie. We got the people that smoke the Za and paper. We got the people that smoke the Za in a leaf or some type of blunt. And we got the people that smoke the OGs in a leaf or blunt or papers. And they all communicate, everybody communicate with each other. And they all talk and they all crack jokes. And it's like it's all a community about who smokes what and why you smoke what. And the shit be fun. It'd be trippy. I think you might need to consider it. Like once, yeah, look, you, once it'd be a group of us gangbanging. Look, 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 it'd be, it'd be, it'd be a group of my guys gangbanging with you and your girls that's over there vaping. And we over there smoking blunts and we telling y'all why y'all should come get some fire. And you telling us how we fucking our lungs up and we just having a good old time. Right. That's 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 how the, the, how the smoke war going. I like mine. Mine blow too. Mine blow hotter. Mine blow hotter. Good old smoke war. <laughs> <laughs> it's a that's vibe, right? <laughs> That's the main reason why I stopped with the uh, blunts was the, they say it messes your lungs and everything. Yeah, that's why I be, that's why I'm thinking of trying to find a paper because I'm not gonna lie, after smoking so many of them, you get the cough and that phlegm up and you look at the color of it. It, it don't be the phlegm for me because you know, you talk to them, but when I look at the color of it, I'd be like, that came for me? It's shit like, looked like oh. the exorcist. Looked like the exorcist or some shit like that. I, that was a little exorcist fit. Yeah. That wasn't regular. 
like, yeah. that wasn't regular shit. I need to go get checked out after this one. But you'll be I, fine. I, 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 I you know, a few times. Ain't it, look, ain't it crazy after you spit that one good spit? It's like a reset. It's, I know it sounds nasty, but it's like a. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, 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 I was good. I'm, I'm, I'm good now. I had to spit. <laughs> <laughs> like you got CPR or something. I, I, I just had to spit. Oh, all right. <laughs> and all the smokers understand it, what we do. Oh, all right, cool. Oh, we see somebody going through it. Just spit. <laughs> <laughs> you are hilarious. And then we'll take, hold on. And then we'll take the blunt right behind them spitting, won't we? Right after they go. <laughs> We'd be like, yeah, you good now? Uh, you hogging that. Let me get that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me let that's me smoke with you. I got my that's why I got my pen. That, that's <laughs> now I'm getting flashbacks. I'm getting PTSD. Yeah. <laughs> you do that with the lighter. You go like this. Am I lying? You take the light and go. Oh, you got to. You got I'm to. I'm smoking Zah. You're not. I I've seen some bougie smokers. Now you have different levels. You have expensive smokers. Now you don't see many bougie expensive smokers that spend a lot of money for some weed. And they smoking it and they're smoking good. And somebody smoking, they don't like it. They just looking at it like they don't, they're going to burn that tip. <laughs> like, I ain't throwing this away. I wish I wouldn't smoke. No, I ain't smoking with them no more. But I'm, look, it's, it's, I ain't smoking them no more. <laughs> they ain't going to say, I ain't going to do it. I ain't smoking them no more. Oh, girl. Why do we think, why do we think the fire kill everything? We go, look, we do the black it and white. That's, look like at that. That's like a little mini flame though. It should kill all Let's do it. Okay, where's the review done at on how many smokers with COVID that burned the tip when they got the blunt from somebody that didn't catch COVID? It, Facts. Look, I know it is. I know you didn't smoke with somebody and, 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 and you was like, damn, they had COVID. Damn. I think I just smoked with them. I did burn that tip. I burned the tip though. I burned the tip though. <laughs> look. I, I'm curious. I burnt, tip, no. I burnt the tip though. I was good. I burnt the tip. I, I smoked right. with him. I did do that. I was good. I was good. <laughs> like somebody is somebody sitting there thinking, like, man, I've been smoking with people who had COVID all year long. I'll be good. All I do is burn the tip. <laughs> I know it is. Look, like, yeah, that's a tip for tip. y'all out there. Cause you know it ain't gone. It's still here. But you know, you gotta be careful. I just went to the store today. They made me put a mask on. I'm like, I'm vaccinated. They was like, nah. I said, that's what's up. Let me go put my mask on. I respect that. Mm-hmm. I do think it's people that was immune to it though. I definitely believe it's people that's immune to um, COVID. I definitely believe that because I know some cases it's like if they didn't been around it like a little too much and they fine. Well, it ain't me. <laughs> I know for oh. sure it ain't me. You had it? No, but I usually always get sick. I've been. A, but how, you don't know what I'm so like, I think, yeah, I wasn't trying you to get it. I wasn't even trying to test it. Like, I get uh-uh. everything. I get. I don't get sick that often. So, I'm one of the people that don't get sick that often. So, I don't know. I was wondering if I was immune to it because some people in my family had it. Like, a lot of people in my family had it. Yeah. I never, never touched it. Nothing. Don't say that too loud because the government might come for you and be like, "We need your antibodies, sir." I'm not, I'm not gonna <laughs> would, and this is a this is a pre recording, so we're gonna make sure we delete that, or we're gonna yeah. say a loud, a loud, listen, a loud piercing noise when I say that that affects the hearing of the government. <laughs> <laughs> right? They gonna be like, "Oh, we gotta go to Chicago, you're gonna give me a, y'all." You gonna give me abducted? <laughs> They're gonna be taking my shit. So I'm I'm sitting in their room like this, like. Tell them stop. Tell right. Them take all my blood. Yeah, they're going to take all your antibodies, sir. It's, it's a wrap. We got a vaccination. <laughs> no. Right. Where Dr. Xavier? Where Dr. Xavier when you need him? Sir Wolverine, now. <laughs> <laughs> you are hilarious. Well, I definitely had fun with this interview. I hope you have fun. And I definitely learned a lot of things I didn't know when it comes to drill, when it comes to you, when it comes to your record label. But I also want to give you the last word before we just close it out and say goodbye for now, because again, I would love to hear in the future some of your artist's music and don't be afraid to always reach out to me. But again- I want to say goodbye. I'm going to say I'll see y'all later. 
Yes. You know? Yes. I'll see y'all later. I pull, I'm pulling back up. See, 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 see you next time on the pull up. Yeah. Let me know. Let me know what y'all want to bring from the from the rack next time. You know, you might want to bring some popcorn, some pizza, or something. Let me know what y'all want to bring out from the rack. Garrett. Mm-hmm. All right. Let's close <laughs> out. Thank you. Though. I appreciate it. Of course. Of course.